Hello, good evening and welcome to News 360 from the News Hub. I am Paul Shigabo. My name is Alfred Okanse. Coming up in the bulletin tonight. News 360 headlines is brought to you by Deluxe Paint. Piccadilly Biscuits and My Life Insurance. Executives of the National Association of Graduate Teachers, NAGRAT, vow to sanction any member seen teaching beginning Monday following their strike action. Ghana School Feeding Program directs all caterers to disregard information of termination of their contracts. Senior Minister heads back at the Netherlands Ambassador insisting Ghana Beyond Aid is already tackling corruption. And also coming up tonight, Accra Commercial Court places temporary injunction on processes that would liquidate GN savings and loans. And police criminal investigations department says it cannot locate dockets of alleged misappropriation of $15 million in an oil deal. Coming up in international news, hundreds trapped on North Carolina Island as a result of Hurricane Dorian. We have details coming up shortly. Do stay with us. In our very first story, the Criminal Investigations Department of the Ghana Police Service has taken on the special prosecutor in what it describes as an attempt to discredit them in an oil misappropriation case. The special prosecutor, in his latest letter to the CID, accused it of failing supply to, to supply it with a 2011 docket on a probe into the alleged misappropriation of $15 million in an oil deal. The CID says the dockets on the case have gone missing for the past eight years. On June 14, last year, the special prosecutor Martin Amido first wrote to the Criminal Investigations Department requesting the duplicate docket in the case involving the Republic versus Georgia Ousu Kwame Bewa Eduse in a $15 million oil deal. The reference was hinged on a 2011 letter by the then Director of Public Prosecutions, Gertrude Ekins, asking the CID at the time headed by Prosper Agblo to instruct the investigator of the case, the late Inspector Noah Bonney, to charge the suspect or prove against the sureties that the suspect were yet to be found. The DPP also directed the CID boss Prosper Agblo to instruct the investigator to take statements from one Jemima Owari of the Registrar General's Department on the effect of forgery committed by Yao Ousu on the registration forms with an express instruction for the docket with a comprehensive report to be made available to the Attorney General's Department. The CID on June 20, 2018 wrote back to the Special Prosecutor and expressly stated he has made strenuous efforts to find the duplicate to no avail. In the letter, the CID also states the search was extended to the late investigator Noah Bonney's house, but the duplicate was not found. TV3 investigations at the CID have revealed a defunct unit under the CID, Vetting Criminal Intelligence Analysis Unit, was in charge of the investigations and headed by ACP Dennis Ablade. The unit has been dissolved since 2014. Martin Amido, again in a long request in June 2018 to the CID, further demanded the CID provided him with the duplicate copies responding to the first letter of the CID stating death should not be an impediment in the search for dockets meant for public prosecutions. The CID was swift in responding to Martin Amido stating it will not relent in its quest to locate the said docket assuring the special prosecutor of its professional cooperation. Martin Amido in his latest request 
to the CID cited by TV3 Investigations described the search from the CID as scandalous because of the money involved. The case has to do with the alleged diversion of $15 million reportedly paid to the government of Ghana as part of corporate social responsibility for the development of the West Cape Three Points area in the Western region. But as a condition for then President John Evans Atamills giving an executive consent to permit the EO Group to assign $300 million worth of shares to Talo, the EO Group agreed to pay the money. The CID has meanwhile started a digital case tracking management system to keep all its dockets and documents. Senior Minister Yao Safo says the Ghana Beyond Aid agenda has the fight against corruption as one of its key pillars. Uh, Netherlands Ambassador, if you recall, to Ghana had earlier challenged government to invest more into fighting corruption rather than its target of Ghana Beyond Aid. The Netherlands Ambassador to Ghana, Ron Strecker, at a Ghana Integrity Initiative program, was worried corruption continued to be the bane of Ghana's progress. Other than that, instead of a Ghana Beyond Aid, the country should focus on the policy of Ghana Beyond Corruption. There is nothing so killing for the business climate, and you need a good business climate to attract foreign investment, I think, than corruption. Of course, high prices for electricity and other things may also be a bit negative, but corruption is a very bad thing. Companies suffer and will stay away if they think that they are going to be harassed by corruption. The slogan now is, the official policy is Ghana beyond AIDS. Why not Ghana beyond corruption? But reacting to the issue, the senior minister who doubles as chair of the Ghana Beyond Aid Committee, Yao Safo Mafo, said the fight against corruption had already been included in every section of the strategic document on the policy. Ghana Beyond Aid is emphasizing the need to fight corruption. The two are not different. And I think this is all through the, it's emphasizing attitudinal change, it's emphasizing mindset, it's emphasizing core values. Talk about core values, it means that if you are to work for eight hours, you yourself, you must know that you must work for eight hours and be paid for eight hours. You don't go and play last, last year and work for one hour and be paid eight hours. That is corruption. Corruption is not only taking money from the government. Or the, corruption is anything you put in place where you shortchange the system, you shortchange the government. The Ghana Beyond Aid document is to be a non-partisan policy framework to transform Ghana's economy and grow it out of the dependency mindset. The document is a 10-point reform agenda that covers agricultural modernization, finance and economy, industrial and private sector development, infrastructure, human resource development, as well as values and attitudinal change. The minister observed that aid was no longer an option for Ghana. According to him, aid to Ghana from 2011 to 2017 has gone down by 50% from 5.6% of GDP to 2.9% of GDP. The Ghana Beyond Aid Committee met with civil society organization for commentary of the draft document. The final document will be presented to Parliament for deliberation. The Upper East Regional Branch of the National Association of Graduate Teachers has announced its members would quit teaching following a strike declared by its national executives over some unresolved welfare issues. They are vowed to punish any teacher who flouts this directive. A report by Tanko Mohamed Rabiu. On September 5, 2019, the national executives of Nagrad at the press conference in Accra declared a nationwide strike to register their displeasure and dissatisfaction over some issues such as delayed promotional letters, responsibility allowances, difficulty in reinstating teachers, delay in promotion interview, transfer issues, salary arrears and other welfare-related matters. The Upper East Regional Branch is throwing its weight behind their national executives. Teachers who have been promoted as far back as three years ago have not been given their promotion letters indicating the effective date of their promotions. This will affect their chance of progressing in GES. Teachers who have 
additional responsibilities besides their teaching duties have not had their responsibility allowances restored after they were promoted. Some teachers have suffered this problem for the past three years. The regional executives warned its members to stay away from the classroom. All teachers in schools that have already reopened should lay down their tools and stay out of school. Those that are yet to reopen must stay out of school when school reopens. We call on all teachers to be steadfast in this industrial act action. So we in Upper East Year is giving our support to the national officers that we are on strike. And we want everybody to stay away from school and don't even go to the school to do anything. The regional executive said they will, from Monday, start monitoring all schools in the region to ensure full compliance of the strike. Well, the Coalition of Concerned Teachers in the Greater Accra region have threatened to go on strike if challenges of its members are not addressed by the end of September this year. It also charged the Ghana Education Service to completely terminate the group insurance cover uh, or risk a court action. Here's a report by Frederick Clarence Williams. According to the Coalition of Concerned Teachers in the Greater Accra region, there have been complaints about teachers' welfare and other concerns for several months, yet authorities have failed to address the issues. On SIC insurance policy, the Coalition cautioned the Ghana Education Service to completely terminate the group insurance cover or phase a court action. The delays in filling the exit forms should not be misinterpreted as though the majority of the teachers are for it. The members have therefore given their respective unions the authority to fight this injustice on their behalf and see to it that this group insurance cover is completely terminated. The coalition also expressed worry about the educational reform as contained in the curriculum review. The new textbooks and the teachers' handbooks are not ready to go with the curriculum review. So how will the change be effective right from the onset? Now, it is being said that the teachers should use the resource pack as we wait for the textbooks to be ready. How long? Speaking on service and promotions, the coalition expressed disappointment over the delays in processing of documents for those who have qualified to be promoted. We are requesting from the Gallagher Service the following time-bound actions. By the end of September 2019, all teachers who have been promoted, upgraded, reinstated, be put on their new grades with all their arrears due them. Meanwhile, the coalition says it is in full support of the strike action by the National Association of Graduate Teachers, NAGRAT. It's not like we are just interested in declaring strikes. If the issues are met, we will not declare any strike. But then if the deadlines we are given, uh, you know, should come to pass and then nothing is done about it. That is where we also advise ourselves. So we fully support them for now. Let's now follow up on this developing story from Zimbabwe and from an imprisoned guerrilla fighter to his country's longest serving leader, Robert Mugabe leaves behind a next legacy. For some, he will be remembered as an icon of liberation, while others will view him as a dictator. Coming up, a profile of the late leader of Zimbabwe, Robert Gabriel Mugabe. <laughs> I am president of my country. We have our own rules here. I say we are sovereign. They should not interfere with our sovereignty. That is all. Veteran leader Robert Mugabe has presided over Zimbabwe for over three decades. Born in 1924 in the village of Kutama, southwest of the capital Harare, he was educated by Jesui and went on to become a leader before joining the liberation struggle against British rule. Mugabe graduated from Katume St. Francis Javier College in 1945. For the next 15 years, he taught in Rhodesia and Ghana and pursued further education at Fort Hare University in South Africa. In Ghana, he met and married his first wife, Sally Hayfron. 
he became a key figure in the fight for independence from white minority rule as leader of the Zimbabwe African National Union and spent 11 years in prison before becoming Zimbabwe's first post-independence prime minister in 1980. He was a key figure in the struggle for independence which involved a bitter bush war against a white minority which had cut the country loose from the colonial power of Britain. When he was first elected in 1980, he was praised for reaching out to the white minority and his political rivals, as well as for what was considered a pragmatic approach to the economy. However, he soon expelled from his government of national unity, the party whose stronghold was in the south of the country, and launched an anti-opposition campaign in which thousands died. In the mid-1990s, he embarked on a program of land redistribution in which commercial farmers were driven off the land by mobs. The program was accompanied by a steady decline in the economy. As the opposition to his rule increased, he and his ruling ZANU-PF party grew more determined to stay in power. Critics accused him of heading a military regime. In the elections of 2008, ZANU-PF lost its parliamentary majority and opposition leader Morgan Changirai defeated Mr. Mugabe in the presidential vote but with insufficient votes to avoid a runoff. Mr. Mugabe was sworn in for another term in June 2008 after a widely condemned runoff vote from which Mr. Changirai withdrew, citing attacks on his supporters. Under international pressure, Mr. Mugabe agreed a power-sharing deal with Mr. Changirai, who was made Prime Minister. However, Mr. Mugabe made no secret of his distaste for the arrangement and Mr. Changirai complained of lack of cooperation and a return of violence against his party supporters. After years of wrangling, the two parties in early 2013 agreed on a new constitution which was overwhelmingly approved at a referendum in March. In late 2014, the president fired Vice President Joyce Mujuru and seven ministers, accusing them of being involved in a plot to kill him. Ms. Mujuru denied the allegation. But under Mugabe's rule, Zimbabwe suffered from sanctions, massive inflation and extreme poverty. Land reforms and black empowerment failed to deliver economic benefits. In 2000, he ordered the takeover of white-owned farms, leading to an economic collapse and hyperinflation at 250 million percent by 2008. Unemployment hit 90 percent, while more than 80 percent of the population was living on just two dollars per day. Conditions translated to long bread lines where supply was scarce. Mugabe will also be noted for his stance against homosexualism. The doctrine, belief that man and man can marry, woman and woman can marry, that destroys nations apart from its being a filthy, filthy disease. In November 2017, Mugabe was ousted in a coup d'etat. These were the last known pictures of Mr. Mugabe. He is believed to have died in Singapore, where he had made frequent visits to receive medical care in recent months as his health deteriorated. For some, he was an icon of liberation, a Pan-Africanist who dedicated his life to the emancipation and empowerment of his people. To others, he will be remembered as a dictator. It was very clear. Uh, the relationship between Robert Mugabe and Ghana goes way, way back. And we're going to be talking about that shortly. But let me go on to the Skype now and speak to Todd Maforimbo, who is a human rights activist straight from Harare in, in Zimbabwe. Now, I uh, thank you, Todd, for your time this evening. Uh, would it be right to say that there's a heavy cloud of sadness hovering over Zimbabwe as we speak? Um, well, it's, I would say that's 50% correct uh, because um, Robert Ngaba, again, has divided the nation um, even in his death. Uh, because there are many unanswered questions and there are many people who, have, who would have sought justice. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the Gokura Hundi. Uh, those people have not had answers. They've, they've not had um, the, the, the chance to um, hear from the man that they believe is guilty.
atrocities. Uh, but the people, obviously, the supporters of Mugabe, the Mugabe family, and those people that were, you know, his right-hand people, so to speak. Yes, they and uh, even when you look on social media, on the streets, in the different cities, in the different towns, um, the Zimbabweans are divided. So it's a it's it's a bittersweet kind of um, you know moment in the in the country. I see. Uh, but but if you speak to the ordinary Zimbabwean on the streets, what is the expression that you get? Is it a clear state of sadness, or indeed others others feel differently? Um, people feel differently. Um, some people, like I said, are, are sad. And um, I mean, the, the majority of people that are sad are actually sad because they believe that the coup not happened, maybe Zimbabwe would have been better. Um, I mean, you get some people saying, uh, you know, the, the, the death of Mugabe just opens up another can of worms because we, we don't know, um, you know, what, where the country is going to go now. You know, even though he was no longer president, there's a firm belief that he was still quite firmly in control of the country because um, they, they speak of Munangagwa as a loyalist and Munangagwa was a loyal soldier to Mugabe. So what, what can we expect of Munangagwa now? Because he still regarded Mugabe as a father figure. I see. So, you know, it, it's mixed. But, but how, how, how did his last years affect the legacy, uh, would you say, that, that, that he has uh, over in, in Zimbabwe? Well, I, I think that the legacy, um, as I understand it, was not necessarily the legacy of Robert Mugabe, but trying to uh, restore the legacy of ZANU-PF. Because um, under the Mugabe um, uh, rule, uh, ZANU-PF had become one of, in fact, it, it's the worst party that we've had in Zimbabwe. When you look at the atrocities committed, when you look at the disrespect or disregard to human rights, right. you know, to um, rule of law and things like that. So um, it's restoring the legacy of ZANU-PF. And this is what they came to do. Um, Mugabe's legacy was obviously taking the land from the white people. Mm. And um, that came to an end a long time ago. And that has not painted a good picture for the country, uh, despite the fact that we now have our land as black people in Zimbabwe. All right, then. Thank you, uh, Todd, as always, for your time this evening. Todd Maforimbo is a human rights activist joining us on Skype from uh, Harare, Zimbabwe. We cross over to Porsche now. We're getting down into history uh, of the relationship between Mugabe and Ghana, aren't we? Yeah, you did say that early on. Coming up, four facts about the late president of Zimbabwe. And the first fact is that his first wife was a Ghanaian, and that's Sally Hayfron. And for the first time, she was married to Robert Mugabe. However, he married Grace Marufu, who, was, who is his present wife. And after Sally's death, he had one son with Sally Hayfron, but he died at the age of four. And he has two sons and one daughter with Grace Marufu. The second fact about the late president of Mugabe is that he was a teacher in Ghana and he was a student of Achimota College where he was trained as a teacher and taught at the Apua Secondary School and the St. Mary's Teaching College in Takwade. The third fact about the late president of Zimbabwe is that he was a lottery winner and in 2000 when Zimbabwe was barely managing to come out of its worst famine and one out of two Zimbabweans was suffering from continuous unemployment, Robert Mugabe's name was the one that was miraculous drawn by the National Lottery in Zimbabwe, winning 100,000 Zimbabwean dollars. That's an interesting fact about the late president of Zimbabwe. And the last one was that he was raised by a single parent and his mother was left alone to raise Mugabe and his three other siblings on her own. And Mugabe tried to help his mother by tending cows and doing odd jobs in his childhood. Indeed, posterity will judge his legacy. Coming up as the MTN Video Report. This is a road that they are constructing at uh, Aquili, a suburb of Kaswa. The road is supposed to be 80 feet, but look at where the contractor put the gutter. He has divided the road into two and put the gutter at the middle of the road. Meanwhile, it starts payers' money, so it means that 10 years going. We have to spend another money to control this road.
Chris Alive here on News 360. Remember, we're live on TV3 Gun on Facebook and on DSTV Channel 279. Stay with us. We're back with some more news after this break. Thanks so much for staying tuned to News 360. Good evening. My name is Nana Ikia Mensabrapa, bringing you the latest in the world of business. Let's begin with a clean up within the banking sector. And Accra High Court has advised lawyers for the Bank of Ghana not to undermine the current injunction suit against the revocation of the license of GN savings and loans. The judge, Justice Kumsin, who gave the caution, said due to a pending application, all actions or processes being undertaken must be put on hold till a determination of the injunction. He further directed lawyers of the Bank of Ghana and other defendants, which include the finance minister, to file their responses and legal arguments within eight days. to some commodities now and cocoa farmers and other stakeholders in the cocoa industry have lauded government for maintaining the producer price of cocoa for the 2018-2019 cocoa season. And according to the stakeholders, their expectations for this year's producer price is high because government assured them of possible increment in October 1 this year. Farmers lauded government for maintaining the producer price in the last crop season, even though there has been a price decline on the international market for three years. We are very happy about anything that improves the lot of cocoa farmers. And uh, of course, we are also excited that uh, the government is going to announce the new producer price. This year, we have been assured of the fact that it will be an increase. You know, in the past, there hasn't been an increase, mainly because uh, world prices have not increased. Speaking at the Coco Life presentation of 100 motorized streamers to 50 group of Coco farmers across the country, the country head Coco Life program in Ghana, Ya Pepra Emekuji, said 18 million cities has been allocated for 29,166 registered Coco farmers this year to enable them implement their development plans in their various communities. She said Coco Life will continue to harness technology and community ownership by facilitating the adoption of good agricultural and environmental practices, protection of rights, especially that of women and children in cocoa growing communities. We believe that by investing in the community, by investing in the farmers, by investing in the cocoa trees, we will be happy that the cocoa beans at the end of the day is devoid of all the things like child labor, is devoid of uh, unapproved chemicals, and is devoid of, let me say, things that are inimical to even our forest. She maintained cocoa life in a bid to shore up revenue, has put in place strategies to support cocoa farmers. Well, let's stay a while longer on agriculture because President Okufuado has appealed to private sector players in the agriculture value chain to join hands with government in order to achieve a self-reliant Ghana. The president was speaking at the commissioning of Omnifet Fertilizer Factory at Doenya in the Greater Accra region. The Omnifet Fertilizer Factory was established in 2017. The Group Managing Director of Omnifet Fertilizer Company, Michael Zomelo, said the first phase of the project employed about 400 Ghanaians. It was hopeful that with completion of the second phase, the company is looking forward to employing some 500 Ghanaians. President Ikufuadu encouraged private sector players across the agriculture value chain to work with government to improve the agri sector. I have great confidence in the Ghanaian sense of enterprise, creativity, innovation and hard work. I believe that firmly that given an enabling atmosphere, the sky is the limit for us. The promoters of Omnifet provide the evidence. And we'll move on from there. 
Right, so on the interbank market, the figures remain the same in terms of the city's performance to the euro, the pound, and the dollar. You can visit 3news.com to get all the detail there. But that will do for business tonight with me, Nana Ikuya Mensa Mapa. Mission is supported by the Star Ghana Foundation with thanks to Danida, UK Aid and the EU. Pupils of Biposo Kindergarten in the Central District of the Ashanti region study in very uncomfortable conditions and this has impacted negatively on enrollment. Bright Dana Amfo reports the Assembly is putting up a new KG block for the school. KG kids studied in this. The school had no room for them. Teachers complained of heat and this made the kids uncomfortable. They therefore struggled to concentrate. The district assembly acted as enrollment figures show pupils were being taken away from the school. It took four months for the structure to be completed. It was indeed a difficult situation for pupils of B. Postle Kindergarten. They studied in this uncomfortable structure. There was congestion and there was heat in the classrooms. Teachers simply did not find work comfortable. But with the completion of this new one, it is expected that there will be improvement in teaching and learning. The structure comes with sanitary facilities. I, I remember when you came, we did mention, uh, made mention of that. And uh, as you can see, the engineers came in and we explained to them. So they decided to extend the initial structure to put in the toilet facility and they have actually done that. An excited head teacher said the old structure was simply a disincentive. We should be the most excited staff on, in this uh, district. Well, when you look at this structure, it's uh, the first of its kind in the district. And uh, we are very happy because uh, we, we are going to be very relieved because of the conditions that we were facing in the old structure. And so we are looking forward to the assembly handing over to the school eventually so that we can move in quickly and make use of that facility. He said the school is eager to move in after many years of neglect. The Central Central District Assembly says education is a priority and resources will be pumped in to ensure every child gets the opportunity to be educated. Bright Nananfo, TV3. And that's it for Mission. Mission is supported by the Star Ghana Foundation with thanks to Danida, UK Aid and the EU. Thanks so much for watching. We have sports news coming up shortly. Do stay with us. While alive, former Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe was admired by many for his hilarious quotes. But the thing is, some of the quotes were made up and did not come from Mugabe. Also, Warai brings us a flashback of Mugabe's popular quotes. May I just ask you one question, sir? On what basis do you now regard yourself as President of Zimbabwe? On the same basis as Mr. Brown regards himself as Prime Minister of Zimbabwe. Precisely on that basis. Sir, you don't want your, sir, you don't want your security man here to beat me up in front of you, I'm sure. Yeah, but don't ask stupid questions. Okay, but yes, he's an iconic character and needs very little introduction. President Mugabe. Well, he's the president of Uganda. That is a lie. Really? I'm president of Zimbabwe. England and let me keep my Zimbabwe. That's a famous quote from Mugabe. It's your money, keep it. It's our land, we will take it. Balance. His alleged quotes are receiving massive publicity. Thank you for the publicity you have given me. That's what's up. But there are some fake ones out there. Yes, I've come here to address that. Okay, let's set the record straight then. Okay. Did you say the only warning Africans take serious is low battery? Yes. Okay, confirmed. A woman with beauty without brains is her V that suffers. Is that your quote? <laughs> Did that come from you? Yes. Okay, confirmed. 
Even if Sashi water best at circle, it causes flood. Hmm? Did you say that? Oh, no, 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 no. Did that come from you? All that is a lie. Really? President Mugabe said no. Okay. Final quote. No matter how men shake their thing after urinating, the last job is always reserved for the boxers. Is that your quote as well? No. Definitely no. Are you denying that? One yes. Point. Well, it's been awesome hanging out with you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for paying so much attention to President Mugabe. On a serious note, when is Mugabe retiring? I'll still be there until God says come. And God indeed called him. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and he's gone to God, you know, in a very peaceful way. Mm -hmm. So continuously rest in perfect peace. On behalf of the rest of the team, I want to say thank you. My name is Alfred Akansi. And I am Portia Gabo. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Good evening. Mm -hmm.